Welcome into Overdrive. It's Wednesday afternoon. We're live on TSN 1050. Up on TSN 4, I am Aaron Karolnik in for Brian Hayes with my new friend Jason Strudwick. Struddy, it is a beautiful day in southern Ontario. This is the first time we've met. I'm seeing your background. You look absolutely exceptional. What's going on today? Yeah, I did a couple extra push-ups and some extra stretching for you mm. today, right? I want to look extra <laughs> nice. Um, and I'm glad to hear. I thought it was always nice in, uh, where, where is it, Toronto? Is that Toronto. where we're talking? On Scarborough, Toronto? Yeah. Ontario. Scar- Agent Court, Ontario. 20 degrees today. Scarborough. Scarborough. Is that close to the Mississaugas? Ah, the other no? side. The other side. Oh, okay. I'm east sorry. and west. I... No, okay. I... N- not a lot of visits to Toronto for, for yourself? Well, I, I, yeah, I've been, I've actually been in that neck of the woods, but uh, mostly stick to Toronto, Ottawa, you know, the, the, <laughs> the, uh, another place, Val d'Or. Is oh, that, is that, a beautiful, is that, beautiful is that this time of year. That is, that is Quebec. <laughs> but I, I will say today is so nice. And that's the only topic of conversation that anyone's having. And all of my degenerate friends are just bailing from work. All right. Which patio are we going to? And people get so horny for patios as soon as there is even the slightest semblance of good weather here in Toronto because we've been cooped up. I guess the weather hasn't been that bad in southern Ontario for the majority of the winter. I mean, it's been pretty mild, not a lot of snow. But as soon as even double digits approach, it's yeah. like, all right, where are we drinking beers outside and how many can I consume before it gets dark? Well, there's two things you look forward to in the spring. The first patio beer and the first round of golf beer. Mm-hmm. Those are two huge things because you can't do it all winter. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. And I've, I've already played my first round of golf last week what? when it was like 15 degrees here. Man, it has been an absurd, absurd winter in this really? type of, in this area. And I can't believe it's been as mild as it has been. But, I mean, we've been blessed. And, yeah, it's going to be like minus five this, this weekend. But whatever. It's St. Paddy's Day. We won't even feel it. So, <laughs> uh, it's, just, uh, it's just great. And I, I think back to my time in London. I went to University of Western Ontario, now called... Western University in London. Sure. And our boy Travis Konechny will join us. He's a good London boy. He's up in about 30 minutes. And I think some of those March Madness slash St. Paddy's days, when the two worked in conjunction on the same, the first day of March Madness, right. one of the great days where it's just all day hoops starting at noon. And it coincided one year with St. Patrick's Day in a beautiful weather. We're out at all these bars in London, Ontario. And bring, today is a day that kind of brings me back to that type of glory, Struddy. It really does. Yeah. The memory I have of my, my best St. Patrick's Day is that we, we, I was playing for the Blackhawks and we were terrible. I think they actually drafted either Taze or Kane, I think, that year. So we were terrible. And um, I, we were able to play on uh, practice on the uh, court that the Bulls play on at, uh, in the, where the Hawks play and at uh, the Madhouse on Madison. And I rolled my ankle. And I'm talking badly. I think I was going up for a dunk, roll it. So now I have to keep playing because I don't want to get in trouble. So the trainer gives me the machine that, you know, you put water in it and then it attached to your foot and just circulates the whole time on your foot. So I went to a little bar in, in, uh, where I, close to where I live, an Irish pub. I sat there for like five, six hours drinking beer oh, and yeah. had the thing on my foot for the whole time. <laughs> the whole time, my foot, I couldn't even feel it about halfway through. So anyways, I finally get home and I, and I keep it on and I played the next day, but I'll never forget that myself, a cold beer and a cold foot for uh, St. Paddy's Day. That's how it's done, man. That's how it's done. Gritty. I, I am certain our boy Bobby McMahon is celebrating with a cold <laughs> one, if not a significant number of cold ones as he has signed a two-year contract extension with the Toronto Maple Leafs, $1.35 million a year. This is an amazing story, Struddy, in that exactly one month ago today, Bobby McMahon was going to be a healthy scratch for the Toronto Maple Leafs. John Tavares is sick that day, doesn't end up playing. McMahon ends up getting a hat trick that game. And ever <laughs> since, the guy's been a, a staple in the Maple Leafs lineup. It's a, it's a remarkable story even prior to this year where he's in the ECHL just a couple of years ago. A true rags-to-riches story, and... It's a really cool tale, and, and I'm sure Bobby McMahon, everyone around the Maple Leafs must just feel so good for him because this is a guy who not long ago didn't have a spot in the Toronto Maple Leafs lineup for this year. Now he's got a two-year contract extension. 
Well, it's good for him, but this is amazing for the Leafs. I mean, here's a guy that, you know, I'm not saying they had written him off, but you're like, okay, is this guy going to work out or not? But when I, when I did a little research on him, I love the fact that he was the captain of his college team uh, at Colgate. And I think that says a lot about a person. I think it speaks to maybe, obviously, your character, but then maybe the work ethic you bring. And, you know, I'll, I always place a bet on the guy who is relentless in his work ethic, who is going to keep trying to get better and not get down by, you know, being sent down or maybe not getting the opportunities he thinks he deserves or should get, uh, but just prepares himself. And when he gets the opportunity, such as the night you talked about, where he was, I, I, he wasn't going to play, then he ends up playing and really has success and goes on this nice run. It's huge for him because he's ready for it. And we see, I think, too often now in hockey, where players want their opportunity and they're not ready when they get it. I think it's better to be ready. So when you, when your time comes, you get your chance. Bang! The coach's like, I didn't know he could do this. Oh, I have been doing it for a long time, but you just didn't give me a chance. So now it's a great. Story. Story. It's an opportunity now for the Leafs. They've plugged another hole uh, in, in their lineup with a guy that is obviously going to have a bit of scoring touch, but bring some other elements as well to their lineup. Absolutely. And I think back to, I mean, so many times, not only in the National Hockey League, but in the NBA, maybe in Major League Baseball, you could consider it as well, where guys are getting massive contracts before they have really done or or really you know, acted upon their potential. And McMahon's a guy who actually kind of did it in the exact opposite way, where <laughs> it's coming from the ECHL. I mean, it, it just everything worked in his favor, and somehow he was able to turn it. And, and this guy's been a very valuable contributor for the Leafs in the third line for a number of weeks now. And you consider some, so many times now in hockey where – Guys who, like, I, and I'm not trying to look at Rasmus Sandin in particular, but he gets a five year deal. I think it was close to five million per from Washington. He's a good defenseman, but like a five year deal for that. And, and there's so many other examples of that uh, in baseball. Guys are signing like long term contracts before they've even played in the major leagues. So this is something for McMahon. He's a 27 year old, has really earned his, his keep in the National Hockey League. And you have to feel really good about this story. Uh, on a number of fronts. But you're right, for the Leafs as a whole, finding a guy who's cheap, I mean, $1.35 million with a rising salary cap on the third line, he can contribute. We saw him score the first goal against Montreal. He's had the hat trick, and he's been a really valuable contributor for Toronto. So that is some found money for Brad Tree Living Company. Oh, absolutely. And, and you need that. You need people come out of nowhere and develop. And so, you know, do you give, I think we should also recognize maybe the drafting developing uh, of the For least. Sure. And, 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 and I think it's, it's funny when young players aren't coming up from the HL and having success, uh, we all love to turn, oh my God, the drafting developing has been brutal. When they do come up, we're like, well, this guy was a, a sure shot. Well, there's no sure shots, right? Especially, uh, you know, even first rounders, unless you're talking top five and even sometimes the top fives don't pan out uh, the way you expect but i think that when something goes right you I, I i often wonder if organizations say okay what went so well with this player why did this player find his way up what did he do what did we do right um what did we do wrong and the ones that didn't and then sometimes players will maybe never develop but i'm always wondering do they do they look and say what went right and why is this guy making it what did, what did he do because you can replicate, right? I, I, I believe that if someone's doing something right, I can copy that and it should work for me as well, um, you know, assuming we have you know similar level of talent. So that's a great story for the Maple Leafs and for Bobby McMahon. And again, it's a two-year contract extension, an AAV of $1.35 million. A guy who certainly worked out is Connor Bedard with the Chicago Blackhawks. He had five <laughs> points last night, and you see some of the – the company he keeps with an eight, as an 18 year old scoring five points, Ilya Kovalchuk, Dale Howard, Chuck. I mean, guys who have had significant impacts in the national hockey league to put it mildly, but really it was what happened near the end of the game. That is picking up a lot of steam online strutty in that <laughs> the six, two game a kind of a line brawl breaks out in many respects. And Peter Morazic's going after Radko Gudis, who was just filling some poor kid with rights. So Morazic <laughs> steps in and I guess Mackenzie Entwistle. Here's, so there's Gudis. You can see it up on TSN4. Just filling this poor kid. And Morazic comes over. He's like, hey, hey, stop that. And then you'll see John Gibson coming down from the other end of the ice. And there he is. He's ready to go. Johnny Gibson, a, 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 good, uh, a good man looking for a tilt. And the refs don't let Gibson and Morazic go. That is a fireball offense for me. Goalie fights are so infrequent. Fighting is back in the NHL as far as I'm concerned with the Rempy influence. And we're seeing, we're having national debates whether if Rappi should fight, should not fight this guy, that guy, black guy, doesn't matter. It's, it doesn't really matter with, with Rempi. The goalie fights, you got to let him go. 
Strutty, yeah. I know you're with me here, right? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Okay. First off, I, I want to comment on the Gibson uh, <laughs> baton-style twirl of the stick oh, as he goes in. Like, what was, <laughs> was, he, was he in the band uh, growing up? He yes. was the leader of the band. And he goes in there and, listen, let, let's just call it what it is. These are two teams at or near the bottom of the standings. They're pissed off. One of them's getting uh, plowed in tonight or uh, last night. The other one's been plowed in other times. It is not fun. I've been on bad teams. I, as a ref, you have to understand, let these guys get some anger out. It's not fun. Like it, Playing NHL is amazing, but you're still pride. You have a lot of pride. You want to win games. So you're mad. You're pissed off about what's happening, what's not happening around you about, as far as winning. So Gibson comes down. He's like, you know what? I'm going to get a little anger out. Mrazic does the right thing goes over and, and 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 tries to help out his teammate whistle and and because Gunas has given it to him and then Gibson comes down does the right thing as well and I've I've rarely if ever seen a goalie get injured in a goalie fight but man has it fired people up oh. I'll tell you what you let them fight they they get it over with and it just brings the temperature down to both teams and probably helps them play out the last fifteen to twenty games they have because it is brutal being on a bad team. Yes, you love being in NHL. I get that. Don't tweet at me that I'm an idiot. It is great being in NHL, but still, you have to go to work and you're trying to win. Let the boys get the anger out. It is amazing. You go to the front page of tsn.ca this afternoon. It's Mrazek versus Gibson and Matt Rempe are the two <laughs> things that people are talking yeah. about more so than anything. And Rempe gets the four-game suspension for the elbow on Siegenthaler, but more so that he did not fight Curtis McDermott, and we've seen Rempe fight Ryan Reeves and uh, Matthew Olivier, Matt Martin, like fighting, and and we didn't get to see it between Mrazek and Gibson. And you're someone with more than a hundred fights on your NHL resume. Fighting is back, man. And like the heavyweight belt in the NHL, I don't know who would hold it right now because I mean McDermott, no one seems to want to fight. Ryan Reeves might have it. Maybe it's Matt Martin. Maybe it's Rempe. But fighting is as like it's it's for it's been forever since. We've seen this type of focus in it, and in large part, it is due to Rempe and him coming up with the Rangers. But it, it's amazing how, like, I was at the the, the Lightning and and uh, the Philadelphia Flyers on Saturday night down in Tampa Bay, and Dumba dropped the gloves early. And there was another fight with Austin Watson, and the crowd was just mm-hmm. going crazy. And like for for whatever reason, and maybe you attribute it to Matt Rempe, or maybe it's something else. But I feel like the interest in fighting is at a decade high, maybe even longer. And I mean, I'm here for it. I mean, as long as it's not staged fighting like it used to be and guys having to answer for total nonsense night after night, uh, I think this is a positive development. And I mean, I don't think it's going any, going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah, it's, it feels like it is having a resurgence. But we got to talk about Rempe for a second. You've got to uh, be able to separate the infraction of the flying elbow and the fighting with McDermott. Yes. So there, there's no doubt that that's, a, that's a, not only a penalty, that's a suspension. I have no problem with the four-game suspension. Um, it would have been if, if it was Rempe, if it was Connor Bedard or Connor McDavid throwing that, they're getting suspended. That's, that's just the way it is. He, he goes out of his way to get the elbow up, and that's a flying chicken wing. That is a penalty all, or a, a suspension all, time, all the time. So the other part of that now is not wanting to fight McDermott Earlier on, and McDermott's comments are inter- uh, interesting. Now, this is after, I believe, the elbow, and McDermott's trying to get to him. But early in the game, he was trying to fight uh, Rempe. And I was told as a young fighter by a guy named Donald Brashear, who was really tough, he said, you fight when you want to fight. You don't ever let anyone make you fight at the end of the shift or at early in the game. If you want to wait, get a couple of shifts in your belt. You do it and you want to do it because guess what? Everyone else will do it and they want to do it. And I always remember that. So I don't believe Rempe early in the game has to fight McDermott. He doesn't have to do that. He doesn't have to fight him. There's, it's up to him. It is his choice um, to fight or not to fight. Now, he's a young guy and he's trying to assert himself in the league. I think that you probably... I have to take that fight, whether it's that game or some point down the road, just to let everyone know kind of where you stand in the, in the hierarchy. But what I didn't like is after the situation, and we saw the, the video there where McDermott was going after him, and he put his hand up and kind of did the supermodel wave uh, on the way by, that's embarrassing the other, the other tough guy, and I don't like that. I think it's one thing just to say, I'm not doing it. You just skate away and keep, your, keep calm and don't, don't, I don't, I don't like that. You know, it's not clown tactics, but it's kind of just, it was unnecessary. So that's the two things that I separate when it comes to Rempe, when he chooses to or not to fight, but then also embarrassing uh, the other tough guy on the other team. Yeah, and you look back to their first game 
the Rangers and the Devils where Rempe just destroys that Bastion kid and yeah. and he gets a match penalty in that one. And that was what McDermott was trying to answer for, right? And that's what yeah. McDermott thought that Rempe should answer for and fight him. And it's a lot like when the Leafs played the Rangers on that Saturday night where Rempe wasn't willing to fight Ryan Reeves until he annihilated Ilya Labushkin into the boards. And then with five minutes left in the game, Reeves is like, all right, let's go. Rempe looks back to the bench. He's like, all right, I, I guess that's what I have to answer for. Right. So th- I guess the, th- the thing with McDermott and with Rempe was this was a incident that happened before McDermott was even on the team, right? Like he was with Colorado <laughs> and he gets traded to New Jersey. So is he the guy that Rempe needs to fight, even though McDermott wasn't even with the organization when that incident actually well, initially transpired? That's You feel like you need to. Yeah. Like if I was been me and you go in that situation, you feel you have to, you've been brought, you're not brought in there to, to run the power play, right? You've been brought in to answer for those situations. But it should be said, and, and it needs to be noted that, you know, if you want to get another tough guy's attention, you run one of their good players. That's how you get the attention. And I always, you know, often I felt like I was responding for something someone else did, like on the other team, right? Or maybe one of my teammates did something, then the tough guy went after him, then I'd have to fight the tough guy. I always liked the ones where I was the instigator, where I did something. Like I, I, I hit someone hard or maybe, you know, a slash when the ref wasn't looking. Like those, I liked it when I was the guy where they were coming after. So, you know, the message I would have for McDermott is do something to one of the Rangers players. And not dirty. It doesn't have to be dirty and elbow guy in the head. You can finish a good hard check on any one of their skill players. Finish a check on their, on their, on their D-man. You don't have to run the goal. You don't have to spear them. But you force their hand. And I think too often in, in the position of the fight, your your reaction, uh, your reactionary to what they're trying to do to your group, rather than doing something to their group, and now they have to come after you. Well, fighting the opposing team is one thing, but fighting a player on your own team is a completely different animal, and that's what happened with the Detroit Red Wings at practice this morning, where Ben Sherratt and Lucas Raymond were mixing it up in front of the net, and they start fighting. I mean, the Red Wings talk about an 18-wheeler falling off the cliff to use a Brian Burke clip from many years ago here in Toronto, but. Like, the, the Wings were solidly in a playoff position. You can see this up on TSN 4 now. Just a couple of weeks ago, they've now lost six in a row. They are falling apart. Teams like the Islanders and Tampa are playing pretty well. It's been a great story, the Wings, and with the Debrinket acquisition, Patrick Kane coming in, and, man, they have just fallen apart here. And You hope they can get it back because hockey is better when the Wings are a competitive team, but... It's looking bad right now. And teammates fighting in practice, the frustrations spilling over into that avenue, that's not a good sign either. Larkin's out, right? And I think he has been out either for the entirety of this or just as it started. I no have coincidence. To confirm on that. Yeah, so, I mean, your captain's out. And then so, I mean, it makes it a lot harder. Take the captain off under any team, and it makes it a lot harder. Um, as far as the fight in practice, you know what? Sometimes it just lets a little intensity out of the room. I you figured you might, like, row, you might like that one. I, I do. Like and no one, no one got hurt. Like, let's be honest. And I, I remember I got in a couple dust-ups with some teammates or you'd chase a guy down to yell at him. But it's you're frustrated. You were in a playoff spot. And you still are in decent position. But you've lost six in a row. Six in a row. And I remember watching them play. It was the last Tuesday's Colorado. Uh, they were in Colorado, I think, and it was 2-2 halfway through the game, and I think it ended 6-2. Makar has a hat trick. Like, you weren't even on the same ice the second half of the game. We were able to play on the same level. So there is frustration. So I think sometimes you go in there, you dust, you fight a little bit, and it's not like anyone was hurt. And then, quite honestly, usually you go into the dressing room after, you kind of laugh about it, and like, the guys joke, and it might just relax a little bit. So I'm really interested to see how they play their next game, if they're maybe a little more relaxed, and it just brings the guys a little bit together, because the one thing it's hard to do when you're in a losing streak is create emotion, create energy. I know everyone says, oh, you're in the NHL, you should play hard. Yeah, we're trying. The other team's trying too. So you got to find a way to get emotion. So this maybe just breaks the ice a little bit, breaks some of that emotional, uh, that emotional dam. And now you have a little bit of excitement about, okay, guys, let's go now take it on the other team. And everyone kind of has a good chuckle and get out. So I'm really interested for next game, see how it shakes out. Yeah, we saw Buffalo put up seven on them. Bo Byram is on fire. Oh, since man. Being acquired. Uh, from Colorado in that trade for Middlestad on on Friday ahead of the deadline. That, that was a great deal. A nice old-school hockey trade, one-for-one, one, defenseman for a forward. Middlestad's playing well for Colorado as well. And uh, they actually win again last night. A goal and assist for Nathan McKinnon, currently leading the National Hockey League in points. He's six up on Kucherov, ten up on your man, Connor McDavid, in Edmonton, who hosts the Washington Capitals tonight. 
and the Oilers took care of business against Crosby and the Penguins. Now the Capitals come to town led by Alexander Ovechkin. And I mean, I don't know if we, if you saw that clip of Ovechkin talking about McDavid and Dreisaitl playing on sep- separate lines, <laughs> but he's like, Oh, like the reporter's like, so what do you make of, of McDavid and Dreisaitl? He's like, well, we have Connor McMichael and Hendricks Lapierre. So it's going to be, uh, it's going to be fine. But I mean, it's been interesting to see how the Oilers have played here in the month of March. They're playing well four one and one. And the power play hasn't really been cooking like we would expect it from Edmonton here. But a matchup against the Washington Capitals may be the remedy from that. Like, they're going to get going. Adam Henrique centering the third line. Um, I think we still see Sam Carrick down the middle as well on the fourth line. How are we feeling at Edmonton right now about the oil? Well, I mean, you're right. Their power play is, I think, one for the last 17. And that's that's crazy. When you think about the totals they would have put up last year. And even including the playoffs last year, they were at or near 50% in the playoffs, which is Pretty incredible. Um, so they're winning in spite uh, of, of their power play not being at the elite level they want. They've had a pretty tough stretch six of the last uh, six games in the last nine days previous to, you know, I think it was Sunday. Um, so a lot of traveling. They came out pretty well of it. But now they, they got Washington tonight, then they got Colorado on mm, Saturday night. I, I think McKinnon's amazing. Don't get me wrong. But Miko Rantanen, this guy is, the, I think, is the least talked about star in the league. And I think he is an amazing, amazing player. Top five in scoring. He's a Elite, elite player, and he wants to be up there with uh, Leon and Connor and you know Austin Matthews, Nylander, all these these top players. So the Oilers, I think they're they're trying to figure out how it's going to fit their second and third lines. There's a lot of options uh, for there for the both left and right wing on Leon Drysaddle's wings. I'm not sure they know exactly who it is or who it'll be when they get to game 83, but they're working through it right now. But Henrik does help because I think he'll be their third line center heading to game 83. Yeah, the West ahead of the deadline, man. That was something to behold. And we talked to Kelly McCrimmon, the GM of the Golden Knights yesterday, and he made it clear. I mean, it was obvious. It's not exactly a revelation, but last year it was the East that was making a ton of moves ahead of the deadline. You think about the Leafs with O'Reilly and Luke Shen, amongst others, the Rangers bringing in Tarasenko, Patrick Kane, Boston with Orlov and Tyler Bertuzzi. That has totally shifted to the West in ahead of the deadline la- uh, this past year. And we saw with Edmonton with Henrique, and we saw with Vegas, certainly. Winnipeg making big moves with Toffoli and Monaghan. The arms race out west was really fascinating. And when I did ask McCrimmon, I'm like, so, like, how much of what you guys did was a response to everybody else? I think his response was absolutely nothing. And I was like, oh, all right. All right. I mean, it's a reasonable question, yeah. Kelly. Come on. But uh, yeah. how, how are we feeling with regards to the Henrique acquisition with regards to what everybody else is doing as far as the potential opponents for Edmonton? Well, I mean, there's no doubt that Vegas got better. Oh, now, yeah, oh, when, yeah. when you look at it, is everyone going to be healthy? Is everyone going to be fitting in together and playing well as they get going? Like Stone, I, I think Stone, I take him over Hurdle. And that's with all due respect to Hurdle. I love the way Stone plays, right? So what point will Stone be back? Hurdle, when is he going to get skating? When is he going to get up and playing? Anthony Mantha, I'm on record. I don't believe he's a Vegas-type player. He's, I don't think he fits their style. Um, but, you know, he, they trade to trade for him. Hannafin, everyone would take him on any team. So they, they made some nice additions. Winnipeg, obviously the, the addition of Monaghan has worked out well. Toffoli, I, I, he seems like he can a, a chameleon. He can fit in anywhere they want. Dallas only made the one real trade, right? For Tanev. Um, you know, I think that that's the targeted as well. I think that they're already a good team, so they're, they're ready to go. Colorado, multiple moves. Um, you know, getting the Kushkin back, obviously, from his time away from the team. That's a big, that's a big addition. Landis Cog, if and when he comes back, what does he look like? Um, so there's, there's lots of things to talk about. Vancouver, we know Lindholm has been kind of middling as far as the, how it's returned for them, but there's still time to get their game on track. So it's great to make the moves. Now you have to fit everybody in and fit the pieces in. So coming back here to Edmonton, I think it's clear Carrick will be the fourth line center. Henrik, I see him as kind of a Nugent Hopkins light. He's a, he's a little bit, you know, not quite as good as Nugent Hopkins, but he's he's like that. Can play anywhere in your lineup, really smart, penalty kill, power play, although he won't get a lot of power play with Edmonton. But, you know, where do they play him? Ultimately, is he the third-line center, or does he slide up and play with Leon Dreisaitl on the wing? I think you're best to put him at third-line center. They've tried Kane and Perry there, Kane and Connor Brown, a former um, Leaf. Does he have a goal uh, yet, Strati? He doesn't. I think I have more than he does I, this year. How he's, is that possible yeah, that he's it's, still goalless? It's really incredible. Now he scored in preseason. I know oh, okay. it doesn't matter. I know it doesn't. I always like, hey, but it's all right. Well, it's part of preseason. But I, I still hope that they can unlock his offense because he is working hard. He's forechecking. He penalty because he's he's a likable player. The problem is the cap that he's carrying. 
Uh, although it doesn't impact the cap this year, next year it's going to be three and a quarter or so against the Oilers' cap. For if he gets, even if he gets two goals, that's a that's a real hard one. And you got Jack Campbell on there as well. So you know the Leafs have been very kind to the Oilers, but also they've served up a couple <laughs> turd burgers <laughs> yeah. cap wise for the Oilers. So no goals, uh, sixty yes, games in, yikes! It's tough. So I I still think there's time for him to unlock himself. I I, I would like to see a line of Kane. Uh, with Brown and Henrique in the middle. Just, you know, wildly older guys, know how to play. Um, and I'd like to see those three guys because I think Henry can really help Kane and, and then Brown works so hard he can help those guys get the puck back. So I'd like to see that. I don't know if we're going to see it. We've seen a bit of it. We've seen some of it. Um, but I'd like for the new coach, Knobloch, or newer coach, Knobloch, to get that rolling. Oilers Capitals tonight. That's a big game, uh, certainly for Edmonton and certainly for the Washington Capitals who look to keep pace in the Eastern Conference wild card race. We also have the Raptors and Detroit Pistons tonight across the network, Struddy. Not a lot of comment. Commentary needed on that one. I mean, <laughs> two really bad basketball teams. The Raptors looking for revenge after yeah. the Pistons snapped their 28-game losing streak yeah. against the Toronto Raptors. That's what we got uh, for that. TSN 1050 up on TSN as well. We'll talk to Travis Konechny of the Philadelphia Flyers on the other side. Darren Dreger coming up. Noodles will join us at some point today. Oh. He's flying in. He will be in Columbus. So we're looking forward to Noodles, your former teammate, Strutty joining the show as the you know the stable member of the Overdrive community. I'm Aaron Karolnik. You're watching Overdrive on TSN4, listening on TSN 1050. Overdrive continues here on this Wednesday afternoon. Aaron Karolnik in for Brian Hayes with my man Jason Strudwick. Noodles will join us just after 5 o'clock live from Columbus. He was calling the Sens and the, and the Pittsburgh Penguins. I almost said Pittsburgh Steelers. Russell Wilson on the mind, Strutty. Russell Wilson on the mind. But uh, Noodles will join us just after 5 o'clock. Uh, it's the Leafs and the Flyers tomorrow night on TSN. Philly picking up a 3-2 win over the Sharks last night. And our next guest has been torching the Toronto Maple Leafs in his last five games against the Blue and White. Nine points in the last five games. He's the pride of London, Ontario. It is Travis Konechny with us here on the show. What's up, man? How you doing? Excellent, thank you. So what is it about playing the Leafs? I know you're a London guy, Travis, but <laughs> you have like a lot of friends and family fl- driving in from London to see you play in Toronto yeah. whenever you, you take take on the Leafs? Yeah, there's usually a few people uh, uh, kicking around for those games, but I don't know what it is, to be honest. I didn't <clears throat> I didn't even really know the uh, the stats until you just said it there. Well, a lot of multi-point games. I mean, there you go. that's that's uh, that's a big big boost for you. And you had that little t- tiff with Austin Matthews as well. Maybe we'll get to that uh, a little bit later. But I mentioned earlier, Travis, that I was down in Tampa over the weekend. Not a good night for your Flyers. A seven nothing loss. But Torts gets tossed and then gets the two game suspension. Can you take us through like what was going on in the bench with Torts? What was he saying to the referees? And what was the reaction to him getting ejected from the game? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, from what I heard, I mean, it's kind of, I'm not sure exactly what happened and, and why he was thrown out because, I, I mean, we've all got, you know, uh, excited and yelling at the refs at, at some point in our, our career. And I, I just, I don't necessarily think it was too crazy from what I heard. Um, and then as far as, uh, you know, after that, it was kind of, the bench was just kind of in shock when, when he was thrown out and, um but then afterwards when you know it was all said and done with and you saw how some of the alumni from that night with the Stanley Cup team were laughing in the box. It was it was a you know, something that we made light of afterwards, I think. Are you gonna make torts buy you guys dinner or something for getting tossed like that? Like what's <laughs> the what's the penalty for the coach? No, yeah, I don't know. I, I definitely won't ask him. Someone else can do that. <laughs> yeah. That's a little risky asking towards that one. But it has been such a great season, and your team has been such a good story, Travis. Not a lot of expectation heading in, but you guys have basically been in a playoff spot the entire year. What do you attribute the team's success to? Um, I think it's just our, our consistency and, in, in like, our work ethic. I mean, I know – you know, there's games that we've been out of it, uh, like you mentioned, the, the one down in Tampa the other night. But for the most part, I think it's just been our team giving ourselves a chance to win every night and, um, you know, keeping it within one goal and, and always being there, uh, you know, for a comeback if possible. And um, I, I just love the, the team and the room. You know, everyone 
in it for the same reasons and we're all pushing to get to the playoffs and uh, it's just a really fun uh, group to be around right now. You know, as I watch your group, you guys are relatively young, and it just seems like you guys never stop working. You're always kind of just buzzing. It'd be really irritating, actually, to play against that. So is that is that the style of the players they brought in, and including yourself, or is that the, the, the style of the head coach in Torts? I think it's a good mixture. Um, I mean, Torts definitely is, uh, you know, he's demanding in the style of play that he wants, and um and that's the one thing that I think he does a good job of. He doesn't waver from that. It's been the same message since he came in last year. And uh, every single game, uh, he never changes the way that we want to play. It's, it's you know, we're playing with tempo and we're playing forward. And um, I think that also plays into some of the guys they brought in. It's, you know, obviously all the young players these days have a lot of talent, but uh, the the young guys that we've brought in, they have a bit of everything, and, and work ethic is definitely something that they all bring to the table, and um, it's actually really encouraging to see because you know you can just you can feel it. It almost gives them uh, a little bit of an older feeling, like they come to practice every day working hard, and a lot of these guys don't you know need to be put back in the line, and as as young players that haven't been around, like I feel like they do a great job of acting a little bit older than they are, and um, you know they're a little bit ahead of. Uh, schedule, I guess I could say, is being professionals. Travis Konechny of the Philadelphia Flyers is our guest. It's the Leafs and the Flyers tomorrow night from Philly. There were a lot of rumors around your hockey club leading up to the deadline. Sean Walker does get traded, but a lot of the guys who were speculated that could potentially be on the move did stick around. Has kind of Is there almost like an air of relief around <laughs> the hockey club post-trade deadline after all the speculation before it? Yeah, it was, it was definitely a weird week for our, our team because um, I think that we had, we'd all worked so hard and put ourselves in a spot that, you know, not a lot of people thought we would be in. Um, and then, yeah, it was kind of just kind of a waiting game to see what would happen. And, you know, again, it's a business and everyone says the same thing. We know it's a possibility. And, you know, unfortunate that walks had to go. Uh, you know, we wish him all the best. Everyone loved what he did for our team uh, when he was here. Um, you know, but in saying that, it was it was great to see uh, Seal stay and you know get signed up. And uh, I mean, there were some rumors around Lottie too, and, and having him here, he's such a big part of the team. I think it was just a relief after that to know like this is our group now, and we can stop worrying about all the outside noise and uh, you know get back to work. I played with Mark Stahl when he was a rookie, and now he's still playing. He's 37. Like, it, <laughs> yeah. is, how old is he? Like, is he? Do you guys have to babysit his kids? Like, what what is Stahl's his, uh, approach to life now at 37 years old? No, he, he's great, honestly. And I, I had heard <laughs> great things about him coming into the team, and uh, he's exactly what you'd expect. He just uh, he's always there for a good laugh, and you know when you need a boost in the locker room, he's there for that, and. Um, but kind of everything. He, he's just that vet that you, you, you expect to be the exact same way he is, you know, uh, and we love having him around. So you play the Leafs tomorrow night. You have had a, a little bit of a tepid history with some of the Toronto Maple Leafs. How do games against Toronto stack up to some of the games against some of the other top teams in the Eastern Conference as far as the quality of opponent? Like where do you put the Leafs amongst the top teams in the East, Travis? Oh, I mean, they're right up there with, with everybody. I mean, on any given night, they, they, they could beat anybody, and it's the same with all the other teams. It's, uh, you know, once you get into the top tier, like, they're all pretty much the same. Um, but, you know, it's it's kind of the approach that Torts has that makes it uh, easy on us is we don't do any film or pre-scouting on any of the teams we play against. It's just all about us and what we do. So we'll be approaching uh, tomorrow the same way as we always do. It feels like the last couple of seasons, it, it was pretty clear who was most likely going to be the Stanley Cup champion, right? Now, maybe last year Boston threw it off a bit. But this year it feels kind of wide open. Would that be a fair comment for both the East and West? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Um, you know, there's definitely some powerhouse teams out there, but uh, you look around the league and it's pretty spread out and you think, uh, you know, there's a lot of teams It's just, this year seems like to be one of those years you just got to get in and, and anything can happen. Well, Travis, we wish you the best of luck the rest of the way. We really appreciate you doing this for us this afternoon. Leafs Flyers tomorrow night on TSN. You'll have a lot of friends and family back home watching for sure. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. All right. That's Travis Konechny from the Philadelphia Flyers. And Strider, you brought this up with Konechny, and I think you're spot on. Like I'm looking at the NHL standings right now. Like, how many legitimate cup contenders are there at the moment? Like You could make an argument that the number is 
11, 12? Like, would you consider yeah. the Leafs as a legitimate St- Stanley Cup contender? Um, am I allowed to say the real answer? No, no, you're going to get no, cut no, off. No. You, you think, <laughs> I think, I think you're, I, yeah, your, your connection may uh, fail. Yeah, I, 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 I think that I feel like the Leafs decor is not clear yet. I, I'm not sure exactly how it's going to fit. And I, when I look at other people or other teams I consider Stanley Cup contenders, I think it's more clear that's what, their, what their six is going to be. So um, I think that's that's maybe the one thing holding up. But, I mean, you look around, you know, Carolina last night, they look great. Uh, the Rangers. Um, you Shesterkin know, has been insane of late. He was dominant last night as well. 100%. You know, Boston, um, you know, there's there's quite a few there. Then come out east, like Winnipeg, um, Colorado, Dallas. You got um, who on the Vancouver, Vancouver Edmonton, Oilers, Vegas. The Kings. Like, there's quite, like, I think you can make a case in, in and around that 10, 10 mark. Now, you get up there, there's every team kind of maybe has a wrinkle or two. But, you know, last year I think it was Boston, but Vegas was right there as well the year prior. I mean, I, I Colorado, I don't know how they were going to lose, right? I think you could play that out, that, that whole playoff 10 times in a row, or 10, 10 times, I think 10 times they win that Stanley Cup. So, yeah, I think it's just more wide open this year, and I think health comes into it, a little, a little bit of luck. I don't like puck luck. I, in fact, I hate that because it just it – just, it makes it feel like it's not in your control. And I think that when you work right and do things properly, you, you tend to get bounces. Um, but, you know, even for the Leafs, you know, if they, they're, they're, their power play is pretty good. Their penalty kill, I think, is just below halfway through the league. But if they can t- tighten up it up a bit, maybe the two new D will help that. Um, you know, you get on a bit of a run and the goalie's situation gets settled. Maybe you got something there, right? It's just such a gauntlet, whether you're in the East or the West. Let's use the Leafs as an example or the Oilers as an example. Like, think about the teams the Leafs will have to go through to even get to the Eastern Conference Finals. You're talking about Boston and Florida. Then you might see the Rangers in the Conference Final. And the same goes for the, for the Oilers, right, where you might see Vegas in the first round. You might see a team like Dallas or Winnipeg. All of, I, you, I view them all in a very similar light. And I think last year, Boston, they had 135 points. And in the first round of the Stanley Cup playoffs, they lost to a team that had 94 points in the Florida Panthers. Now, that doesn't really mean anything for this year, but what it speaks to is that there's a lot of parity in the National Hockey League. And I think this year, more so than any, any year I can remember in recent memory, like there are a lot of really quality teams that are very similar to one another, and puck luck may very well determine the fortunes of those teams, as unfair as that is. Yeah, no, it's it could be true. Um, I think the other thing is just goaltending. You know, you think about last year and and the whole story for Florida. And I can't believe I didn't bring Florida up in the East, but oh, yeah. uh, you know, you look at their goaltending last year it was kind of all over the place, and all of a sudden, boom, the big man uh, he takes it on Sergey, and, and he finds his A plus game, and he takes them on an incredible run. Not that the players weren't doing stuff, but I I would think that without that goaltending, it was going to be pretty tough for them to kind of go for it. So. Their their goaltending as a part of it. A player's getting hot, and obviously health. I mean, health is so huge. So you want to try to get these early rounds done in four or five, if possible, to be fresh. But also, if you're not playing, you're not getting hurt. That's exactly it. And and I I we bring it to the Toronto Maple Leafs, who will start Ilya Samsonov in goal tomorrow night against the Philadelphia Flyers, which I think is a little bit interesting because Samsonov and Wall have been going back and forth, mm-hmm. back and forth here since Wall returned from injury, but. I mean, Samsonov did start Saturday against Montreal. I thought he was really good. And the Leafs are giving him the nod again four days later after a, a pretty significant layoff. So what that means for how the Leafs view their goaltending, we'll get into that with Darren Dreger, our hockey insider, in about 20 minutes' time. Again, Noodles will join us at the top of the clock. We have Herm Edwards, the coach from ESPN. Oh, yeah. We'll talk a lot about the National Football League free agency ongoing. And Nick Saban, the former head coach of the Alabama Crimson Tide had some really pointed comments about the current state of college football. We'll get to that with Herm when he joins us in the 6 o'clock hour. Aaron Karolnik, Jason Strudwick, you're listening to Overdrive, watching it as well on TSN 1050 and TSN 2. Overdrive continues. It's brought to you by FanDuel, bringing you everything from the opening line to the final score. Aaron Karolnik, Jason Strudwick with you. Jamie Noodles McLennan, your boy Struddy, will join us. In about 14 minutes' time, we're looking forward to Noodles arriving from Ottawa to Columbus. I don't really know if there's a direct flight from those two cities, but (laughs) we're going to find out in Noodles' travel sagas when he joins us at 5 o'clock. Darren Dreger also coming up. We'll play role play level of concern at 5.30. And I imagine if you're a Yankees fan today, you have a significant 
amount of concern with your ace, Garrett Cole, who was as good as any pitcher in baseball last year. He has UCL soreness and will miss one to two months. He's meeting with one of those famed elbow surgeons, Dr. Neil Elitrosh, which is like basically if you're having a meeting with one of those guys, that's as bad as it gets. It's a very ominous sign. So for Cole and for the Yankees, big time yikes. Who and is going to miss some time at least. But you know, if this meeting with Dr. Neil Atrash goes the wrong way for Cole, that could be a very significant absence for the Yanks. A lot of pressure on Dr. Neil. Let's be honest. Yeah, no Every kidding. Yankees fan is like, what's this guy going <laughs> to say? The guru. <laughs> the guru of elbows. So th- this is the truth. I mean, when you're, it doesn't matter what sports you're on. If before the season goes, even starts, you're, if not your most important player, one of your most key players is unavailable to you for a period of one to two months. And, and that's pretty vague. You know, that, that's a pretty big window of opportunity of time. It is really concerning because you don't replace that guy. You know, I guess perhaps towards the end of the season, you can maybe trade for another starter, but not a guy at this level. Those guys are usually don't come available. Um, so it is a real level of concern. I guess, on the flip side, you know, one team's loss is another one's gain. So if you're in that division, they at least, you know, mm-hmm. if you're uh, a Blue Jays fan or Red Sox fan or whatever, uh, Orioles fan, you know, there maybe there's some a Rays. I don't know. There's probably a few Rays fans. But, you mm-hmm. know, it's, it's an opportunity because now if that guy comes out, now all of a sudden your chances are, you know, maybe looking a little bit better. So there is speculation that if Cole is indeed out for a significant period of time, the Yankees can pivot and just – sign a guy like Blake Snell or Jordan Montgomery. Fair point. Two of those arms who somehow inexplicably are still free agents uh, represented by Scott Boris, MLB super agent. And maybe that was kind of the plan. I know it's kind of a stupid plan if this was the plan, but maybe Boris was like, maybe there'll be an injury in spring training. And all of a sudden the Yankees could be missing their ace and they'll be like, Hey Boris, we actually do need your clients. Here's the amount of money you were looking for from the beginning. And the Yankees are equipped to hand that out to him. And you know, this is a team that just traded for Juan Soto who has a one year deal with the Yankees. Then he's a free agent next year. So this is an all in year for the Yanks. I can almost assure you that if Garrett Cole is out for a long period of time, they will be signing one of those two guys immediately. <laughs> yeah, That's a good point. That's a really good point. And I guess, you know, are the Yankees still hated the way they were when Derek Jeter was there, Bernie Williams. No, um, because they're not as good, right? That's right. And, and they were exactly. so good for so many years. They were locked for the playoffs, and they I mean, they missed the playoffs last year, but mm-hmm. you know, they still have Judge. Judge and Soto in the middle of your lineup is, is bordering on unfair, but Cole was the real linchpin because this guy, every single time he was out there, was throwing seven innings with one earned run and ten strikeouts, uh, winning the American League Cy Young, just utterly dominant, especially against the Blue Jays. Last year, like he was untouchable for the Jays and him being out of the lineup is a, is a big boost for Toronto. And we did see Joey Votto make his spring training debut today as well. A couple of hard hit balls, which is a good sign, which is a good sign. But, you know, Votto, it's going to take a little bit of time. He just got to camp this past weekend. I don't think you can expect him to hit the ground running and start, you know, bombing balls out to right field time and time again. But it's a really <laughs> cool story, Votto. And I think everybody around this these parts, Strutty, are hopeful that Votto can find his way onto the roster. But at the end of the day, a story is just that, right? You're talking about the real story that Blue Jays fans want is one that results in them making the playoffs. And if Joey Votto can be a, a key cog or just a cog in that type of machine, that's one thing. Maybe it's Vogel back. You're talking about bench players, but yeah. Votto is quite the character. And I think there's a lot of people who are hopeful that he can find his way onto this team. Very likable, but I actually believe the Blue Jays put himself in a difficult position because Joey Votto is one of the greatest Canadian ba- baseball players ever. Maybe, you know, here Larry Walker, you know, maybe Ferguson Jenkins yep. is another guy. So he's, he's amongst the top of all, and, and an excellent also for, for all time baseball players, obviously. But if this doesn't work out for whatever reason, now you have to release this guy. And so I get the idea that it's, you know, they're, you're bringing him in. So my feeling is that. They must know on some level he can he can still do what they're thinking he can do because I don't think that as a franchise you want to be the one that cuts this guy right and it's, it it's, ends it's, it's like that's the end like if Votto right. doesn't make the Jays that's the right. career is over no one was calling him right Votto called the that's Blue right. Jays not the other way around and that's yeah a little concerning if you're Joey Votto and and your future but at, at the same time I mean I think 
It would be a really cool story, but do you think there's pressure on the Jays to, to keep him around? Is that what you're implying? I just think – I don't think there's pressure to keep him. I just think that, you know, it doesn't look good optically if you release this guy because people like him. He's so well-liked. Like, even the post he did uh, about his pegs are packed and he's ready to go. Like, it's it's, it's so cool. Like, I, I think he's a great – he's a very good guy, but I don't want to be the guy to cut him. You know, he just I, – I, it's just so – I don't think there's pressure, but if if it comes down where he's, I think he's going to be, he's got to put himself in a position where it's clear that he is the best choice. And if he isn't, do you still keep him? I don't think you can because you're trying to win, right? That's what the the Blue Jays are trying to do is win. And so I, I, I don't know, man. I, I'm not sure I would have made that choice if I was a Blue Jays. I wonder if the most likely outcome here is that Votto just goes to AAA and just waits for an injury. Like to one of the Blue Jays yeah. infield, maybe yeah. like you know, you hope it doesn't happen. But maybe Vlad Jr. has something happen to him. Maybe it's Vogel back. Uh, maybe it's someone else on the roster where Votto's like, all right, that's the spot where I can contribute, and he gets at bats too, right? Like yeah. Votto joined the team again this past weekend, so but that, he's he's that behind the eight in ball. the majors. That many years in the majors, you want to go and ride the bus around AAA? I, I don't, don't know, think man. that sounds that's very tough. Joey Votto's made a call. lot of money. He can buy the bus and drive it himself. <laughs> If that's by the what, team. if that's what he's by the team, <laughs> uh, exactly. All right, noodles is coming up. Looking forward to that. Darren Dreger, role play level of concern. Hour one, it's in the books. Hour two ahead here on TSN four and here on TSN ten fifty.